we now have time for um, some questions or comments. Um, I can't see anybody in the chat who's yet um, indicated they want to say anything. But if you just want to um, wave, if you've got anything you'd like to say, please. Ah, now I can see Catherine West, who's um, an MP who's been really important in our APPG for a number of years and has fought really hard for um, the community. So, Catherine, do you want to start us off? Well, could I just start, Chair, by thanking you for all your amazing work and just so that others on the call realise that, you know, this issue is completely synonymous with Diana's work. So, um, and I was really pleased <clears throat> to come back from the election in 2019 and see that your work had been recognised. So really pleased about that. Um, there's nothing like hearing personal stories because obviously as MPs, we get loads of emails but just listening to those stories today, and maybe it's also because of lockdown, you're feeling a little bit more kind of raw, but they are really, really moving stories. And I guess my question is, um, and I know the Royal Ferry quite well because I represent Hornsey and Wood Green, which is not too far away. But my question really is who's doing the audit on what's available regionally and where the gaps are? Because I suspect that there is probably some best practice that we don't have at the Royal Free or the Whittington or the North Mid that maybe you do in other regions as well, or you may have particular, you know, uh, partnerships with universities or research. So I'm just wondering, is there somebody chair who's doing that audit so that we could maybe bring that back to parliament for more discussion and debate? Is somebody able to answer that question? I wonder, Clive, as the chair of the Haemophilia Society, are you able to answer that? I, I can answer it, and I'm sure lots of other people might want to chip in. Too, but, um, last uh, Earlier on this year, uh, in fact, over the last year or two, there's been a quality review um, of all centres, all 37 centres across the UK. Uh, and actually, um, I wouldn't, of course, I'd encourage you to read all of them. But the easier option is there is an overview report which was published back in April, which is an overview of all the where the gaps are it was the report that Paul and I were referring to forgive us if we weren't quite as clear as we might have been earlier um, but yeah that has been done um, we know where the gaps are hence why Paul was quoting numbers such as 60 percent of centres don't have the haemophilia care and absolutely um, going back to your point Catherine there is that best practice too this wasn't a wasn't just a negative critique of everywhere this is very much a case of and here's the best practice and this is what we should be doing and sharing um, so that has been done um, and it's important that that report doesn't sit on the shelf and something happens with it and um, improvement does happen because I think if you look around the country there is best practice all around the country and if you add it all together then you would have a perfectly well working system it's not I don't think it's about re revolution in the system it's just about evolution and getting everybody up to the same standards and levels. I've just seen in the um, in the chat I think it was Pratima has made a, a comment I'm sorry I can't see you on yeah. on my screen but I don't know if you want to say what you just put in the chat. Oh, hi, Diane. Hi. hi. Sorry, I was uh, yeah. trying to unmute myself. Sorry, I'm on behalf of the UKHCDR. I'm representing the UKHCDR. I think in uh, 2019 and 2018, there was a peer review that was undertaken, which was a joint exercise between the UKHCDR and the West Midlands group. And the report was submitted to the uh, clinical reference group in December of uh, 2019. And of course, I think uh, there has been a lot of push by the chair of the CRG and also by the chief commissioner uh, to review the report, but also to address the gaps. And I think, of course, COVID has happened. And at the moment, we are a little bit unclear in terms of uh, how the challenges will be addressed. But I think, um, as mentioned in the report, the major challenge is the lack of consistency of care across the country, particularly with regards to the physiotherapy support and also the psychological care. Uh, I mean, I know I probably are reiterating what has been stated, but it makes a huge difference to individual patient outcomes. I mean, we can give the best medical care, but if that is not joined up, then it does not actually translate into a outcome for an individual patient. So at the moment, care is a little bit piecemeal. We're giving them drugs, but we are not actually cementing them into a consolidated action plan. And I think that is a challenge for all of the hemophilia treaters. How do we bring all the pieces together? And how will the commissioner support us in doing this? 
Well, I can see in the chat that um, uh, Catherine's already suggesting a way of, of making sure that this issue is raised by doing some written parliamentary questions. So I think that's a that's an excellent idea. I also notice that my co-chair, Sir Peter Bottomley, is on the Zoom call. I don't know, Peter, whether you want to to say anything or ask any questions. Um, I don't really want to ask a question. What I do want to do is to, first of all, if you don't mind, just close your eyes and thank you for all that you do with, uh, with the Human Fields Society and with everybody in Parliament. Without you, government wouldn't have got further, the NHS would have been not quite so good, and people wouldn't have had the hope that the further changes which are needed were more likely to come about. So I, I join in a round of applause for you. The second thing I want to say is just a little bit of a, a look back. I was doing a street surgery and the person came up and said, hello, Peter, how are you? I said, I'm fine. Do we know each other? He said, we do. I said, how? He said, uh, I'm a haemophiliac. I had really intense problems. I was dying. I said, you're so-and-so. He said, yeah. Don't you recognise me? I said, of course I don't. You're twice the size. You're cheerful. You look absolutely miserable on the point of death when we used to see each other. You're a transformed person. If I may say so, I can say I said to him, I'm a transformed person because I was glad to be able to be with you when you were in trouble. And thank you very much for coming along to show me the new you. And it's that kind of transformation. If we can avoid problems when we can, cure those we can, and care for those where we can't, I think we're doing the sort of work which members of parliament should be doing and many others should be doing as well. So uh, to the Hemophilia Society and to you, thank you. And to everyone who's on this call, I'm grateful to you too. That, that's very kind. Thank you. And of course, I, I think the um, the APPG is made up of MPs from all parties uh, across the House of Commons and the House of Lords and uh, has been a real, I think, a force for good over the last few years. So we want to carry on punching above our weight, really, and making sure that the recommendations from this inquiry are taken seriously by government and the NHS. And I think um, Cathy Harrison would, would like to... Um, contribute i know you've put a um something into the chat but over to you kathy so it was just to add on really to what clive had said already um and pratima actually um the um so following the peer review one of the things that nhs england and the crg have been looking at is actually where there was the best practice actually what was helping provide that best practice was it the numbers of staff was it was it actually how they worked so actually what they're looking at is the data sets that go with that so that whole um that big final total of staff within each of those centers who has the best outcomes related to that actually who scored across the board very well from a quality perspective and did that relate to staffing figures? So that's something that the CRG and the data analysts within NHS England are already looking at, um, which hopefully will provide us with some idea of actually safe staffing levels and um, most appropriate, best quality um, for services to be run like in the future. Thank you for that. And actually, we've got John Hanley on, who is the chair of the clinical reference group. I wondered, John, would you like to, to add anything to that? Thanks very much. It's been very interesting listening to the discussion. Um, I, I read the report with interest and one of the things that struck me was within the body of the report of the recommendation, there was a huge amount of overlap with the uh, recommendations that have come out of the peer review. And um, there, there have been a number of um, attempts to raise the profile of, of uh, the peer review. and. One of, one of the things that a lot of places seem to have a stumbling block is um, the staff running a, a local haemophilia centre um, try to make a, a case of need within their trust. They often get trust level support. And then um, there seems often seems to be a gap between the, 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 what's needed at trust level and support from the local commissioners. And within the uh, discussion, the CRG, we've been trying to come up with ways to bridge that gap. And um, I just wonder if um, the, uh, the, what you might regard as the political influence on the discussion might, might be helpful to try and unlock some of those um, local situations where there seems to be a, a a, a kind of um, 
a lack of prioritisation uh, where the need has been clearly identified, but then there's there's a, a will in terms of uh, the funding coming through. So that I, I think that's the main reason why we see this uh, patchiness in provision around the UK. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. And I think Paul, did you want to? I know you're contributing to the chat. Do you do you want to come in at this point? If we could. Um, uh, yeah, I'm on mute. Um, yeah, I would echo what John says there, and I think we we certainly have been fallen victim to putting forward a very very effective business case, and we're a big enough centre where we feel we need more more physio provision than we currently do, and we have a we would be deemed to have a lot in the sense that we have a full time equivalent. Um, the issue is always around money because centres say, or we don't have the money for a physio, where's the evidence that it works? Um, but actually you need more physios in post <laughs> to be start to get the evidence. So we're between this rock and hard place. The best we have is um, the Netherlands uh, physios um, a few years ago did a cost analysis where they showed that less than 1% of the total spent on drugs would be enough to furnish their entire country with enough physiotherapy provision for people with haemophilia. So if you even use that as a ballpark figure of what we would need to be looking at. Um, Canadian Haemophilia Society have done the same where they looked at, they um, found that two to 3% of the cost of save, savings based on um, new treatments would be enough to furnish everybody with enough physio and psycholo uh, psychological support. Um, and I think there's an ongoing cost issue where we in centres are often um, encouraged um, to get people on the most effective treatment, which is obviously the best thing to be doing. Um, but sometimes with those efficiencies comes a financial efficiency where we save money, but the money then disappears. So you sort of you, you, you perform in one respect and you get punished in another, um, where we are sort of stuck in this ever, this constant circle of trying to make service improvements based on uh, less money uh, because you do need to spend to save you need to get people in post to start making those differences and to start making those changes um, and I think that you know, is, is a huge problem um, is, is the basic having a money to get a post set up okay thank you for that would anybody else like to ask ah yes um it says Susan's iPad sorry I know you're a baroness so um if we could unmute Susan's iPad, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's Suma from House of Lords. Yes. I just wondered if with coronavirus, has it been difficult getting treatment for people with haemophilia? Who'd like to take that? Yes, Kate, please, yes. If we could unmute Kate. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so I think for people who have severe bleeding disorders, they are all or nearly all on, on self-treatment at home. And that product has been uh, continued to be delivered to them at home. So they've been able to carry on with their treatment. I've heard only this week of some people with less severe uh, conditions who can't treat themselves at home, who have chosen not to come to hospital. Uh, so they've sat it out at home and not been treated. And I think we need, and the society is doing this, I know, but we need to, to emphasise to people that if they're bleeding, they can come to hospital and they can do that safely. Okay, what about, it, what yes. about physiotherapy? Getting physiotherapy, is that difficult? Um, yes and no. <laughs> In the sense that physios often quite like to get their hands on um, and often with bleeding, is it a bleed? Is it pain? Is it something else? That often needs a physical assessment. Certainly the first few months, that was very, very difficult, but we got a workaround where we got, we encouraged people to come if we felt it was necessary. We have the advantage with those of us uh, in centers where we know the patients where we were quite easily, we could easily adapt to Zoom because we already had relationships. So we could, we didn't have to take histories and do all of the other preamble. So it is, it's been more of a pro um, than we thought it was, um, but I get the things like rehabilitation services have have all but gone. There are no very there were very few active gym rehabilitation gym spaces available to use. I think that 
that's a saved up problem which will come back and I think in the next few months this is going to be a real issue um, where we can't we have no space in hospitals to rehabilitate people um, but that's a yeah Okay, right. Well, that that's um, that's something I think the APPG will want to be perhaps looking at in the uh, the next few months. Can I at this point just say a very big thank you to all our speakers um, today? Um, personally, I also want to thank everyone who took part in the inquiry and gave evidence. Um, I, I'm sorry that it took so long for this report to be produced, but obviously it was for good reason. But I do think now it's a very helpful document as we start to uh, press government and the NHS on how we can improve services and treatment options for people. So we will certainly be doing that as an APPG. I think as um, MPs, we'll want to press in the House of Commons to see if we can get this debated, this, this report debated on the floor of the House or in Westminster Hall. And as Catherine was saying, she's going to already start putting down some written parliamentary questions. So this is the, this is the start now of how we can use this effectively. But I just, again, wanted to thank everybody for their time today. And particularly, can I just thank the Haemophilia Society, who are our excellent secretariat um, to the APPG and do an enormous amount of work to support us. So thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you all again at our next APPG meetings in the future. So thank you. Have a good day and keep safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye.